Welcome, everybody. It's Veil of Sound. It's the middle of July nearly, and at the middle of July, one of, um, I would say, one of the pioneers of our little scene uh, in a certain way will re-release their records. Um, I'm very, very happy to have Stephen Immerwar, or as the Germans would say, Immerwar, here with wow. us. Stephen from Codeine, thanks for joining the show. Thank you so much, Thurston. So uh, I, I will try to pronounce it in an English way, but I uh, I know that I Emma might. Bar is, bar is good. I, yeah. Okay. Uh, That's how my family pronounces it. It's it's yeah. So we'll come to that in a moment. First question here on Veil of Sound is always: if you are any, wearing any kind of band merch or anything related to music at the moment, what is it? Uh, I'm wearing, that's funny, I'm wearing an Iskra shirt. This is um, from, um, I think, British Columbia from Canada. Mm -hmm. um, crusty, uh, anti-racist, black, yeah, punk. They're, they're amazing. Okay. They, they so have not been super active recently, but um, they're great. So before anybody asks, I'm wearing a shirt from my one of my favorite Swiss bands. Um, and, you know, I like the stuff when you have a little bit of free jazz and a little bit of Jean Zorn meets even more punkish elements, Convulsiv uh, from Switzerland. Shout out to those people over there. Second question, Stephen, where are we catching you right now? So I live in Brooklyn in New York City. I'm about... I don't know, eight minute, nine minute walk from John Engel um, in the Clinton Hill area of Brooklyn. And uh, does does um, does Chris also still live in New York or did he move somewhere else? So Chris, after college, Chris has mostly been out of um, Cambridge uh, up in up in Massachusetts near Boston. Um, he lived in in Seattle for a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's mostly been out of Cambridge and that's where he is. That's where he is now. Um, has always been kind of a challenge for the band back in the, certainly back in the nineties to have Chris living in another city. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, so that's where Chris is. But you managed for definitely a few years and uh, those few years brought along some very, very important records will come to the importance of Codeine. In, in a few minutes. Um, Codeine itself is a very strange name. And you and I already talked about it in the little conversation we had before the interview. It's it's bad to search it on the internet, right? <laughs> but um, as someone who is taking Codeine at the moment against my cough so that I can sleep only at night, don't worry, people, I'm not addicted. Uh, but codeine is said to be highly addictive. People say that about the, the, the medicinal drug, you know, you read it everywhere. But, you know, when whenever I think about that sentence, codeine is addictive, the first thing that comes to my mind is your band. Because I think, in a way, you wrote songs that are also highly addictive. Is that something that you strove for, you know, like making music that people love and that they can fall into? Uh, that's very kind of you to say. Um, I, I think the name really is was more about the kind of an emotional <clears throat> an emotional state of, um, I don't know, like maybe like numbness or disassociation or distance. And um, I'll, I'll confess that, that when we were making songs in the in the 90s the last thing i thought about was like whether other people liked them i that was important to me that john and chris liked them and that i liked them but um i was in some ways suspicious of people liking the band um you know not for great reasons but i was just like well why do they like this band is a music is fairly in some ways i thought esoteric and other way and kind of challenging um, you know, why would people like an obscure band? Um, but I'm, I'm a lot more, um, I'm, I'm much more pleased these days that people still care and, and get, um, you know, get meaning from the, from the, from the music, which back then I really didn't, 
I, you know, was so self, like thinking about our own stuff and wanting it to be great that I really didn't think about how others might take it. I just wanted it to be great. Hmm. But then let me ask one question that I wanted to ask a little later, but I think that, that plays in very well here. You said that you didn't so much care about what other people thought about the songs. But then on the same hand, on the same side, they're, they are really accessible. You know, it's not as if you're building um, a, a wall of like dissonant distortions and stuff. Um, so this this accessibility, did that just come by chance or did, you know, did you strive for that? Did you look for that? I think the accessibility came from a couple of of things that really were like important to me or kind of things that that resonated with me as a as a as a young person. <laughs> the first Paul McCartney record, the first Who record. <laughs> Um, uh, Dusty Springfield 45s, and um, probably the first, um, the first Jesus and Mary Chain singles, which I think are insanely addictive um, and deeply, deeply poppy. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you know, like I, I may, you know, and maybe recently have come to metal the last 10, 15 years, maybe, but, but certainly prior to then, my like the things that I listened to and have enjoyed it, have been more more pop and and uh, and more accessible. That is very interesting that you say that because I can see some of the things that you mentioned, like McCartney, um, who, but I never would have guessed Dusty Springfield. Um, is that something that that came through you yourself that you just like Dusty, or was there some kind of I mean, like it's often the case, right? Like a family member who introduced you to Dusty Springfield. Um, I went <laughs> shortly after I moved to New York. I I bought um, a couple of beat up Dusty Springfield forty fives off the street, and um, man, they just they just hit me. I I think she is really like the she is to me the 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 pinnacle of of female white soul singing. I just. I, I deeply, deeply love Dusty Springfield. Would you also say that she's underrated? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, she's a huge, you know, she was a gigantic star. Um, and, um, and then, and then had this kind of spectacular comeback with the, with the Pet Shop Boys. But, but for me, her kind of like, not, not unsoulful, but, but um, Dusty in Memphis is actually not, the kind of like for me, that's not the best of her. I really like her earlier, her mm -hmm. early singles, mm -hmm. and as a just as a pop, like as a as a singer, yeah, I just lo I love her voice. Um, I I kind of later found out that she was like a terrible perfectionist about her her voice and her singing. Um, for instance, all the all the vocals for Dusty in Memphis were were done later in New York City because um, she didn't like the ones that she'd done. Down there, so um, yeah. For whatever reason, her voice has really, really, really um, spoke to me. And and um, you know, I think she had a lot of she had a lot of challenges being a being a lesbian in a world that that's just that was just not a thing, yeah. um, or being bisexual in a world that was just just not a thing back. Uh, Which back then was even probably worse, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there she has the famous quote where she said, like, people ask me if I like. Um, uh, sex with uh, no, I liked boys or girls, and I said yes. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. Um, that that was a hard time. Um, yeah. let's let's jump a little bit backwards to the reason for this interview. On July fourteenth, you and your band will re-release a few records, seminal records, if you ask me. You're going to re-release Frigid Stars, Barely Real, which is an EP, if I remember correctly, and The White Birch. And you are also, if I remember correctly, re-release uh, an album called Dessau for the first time on vinyl ever. Um, how does it feel to re-release records that are basically 30 years old? Uh... 
It, well, first of all, I think they look beautiful. <laughs> so that I, I think Numero did a lovely job. And um, it is like, uh, you know, back when these records came out, like colored vinyl or, you know, splatters or other kinds of things were like soup was, was just very, very rare. Um, and now it's less rare, but it's still beautiful. And so I, I really, I think they just did a, a, a lovely job um, with them and, and the, the records I think sound really nice. Um, I'm very proud, I'm, I'm proud, you know, back 30 years, I didn't think that this music would be something that would be paying, you know, that anyone would be paying attention to. Um, I was telling someone, you know, this, when we signed, um, first with Glitter House and then with Sub Pop, when we signed with Sub Pop, um, we basically signed over our masters in perpetuity. And while I had gone to college, I was in my mid twenties, I had no idea what in perpetuity actually meant. And I'm very sure a lot of people don't know it nowadays. And, yeah, and here it is 30 years later. I mean, whether that was a contract or not in perpetuity was something that like, how would a 25 year old know? And so it is deeply gratifying that, um, that people still care about the music, that it still does something for them, not just for, for people that heard it back then, but people who, who listen to it now. Um, and yeah, I'm, 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 really, I'm really pleased. I think also, you know, I had a lot of concerns in 2012 when we got, got together to, to play shows for um, the initial reissues that Numero, Numero did for, for the band. So why should people listen to music from, well, at the time, yeah, music from 20 years ago played by people who were like, you know, in their, in their, uh, like that point, 40s. Um, and the experience, you know, the, the talking to people at shows and seeing the, the, I don't know, meaning or like the importance of that or the, how it affected them. Um, really turned my head around. It's like, okay, I'm not going to worry about whether bands from the past are are doing shows again, and maybe even just playing the music that they did, um, you know, 20 years ago, or in this, you know, in this case, like from the from the 90s. Um, if it means something to people and gives them like solace, there's a lot of pain in the world, and um, it is it's like it's gratifying to me, but also like it's meaningful to them. And that really erased any kind of concerns I had about like, gosh, why would old people playing old music be a good, be a good thing? It's interesting that you mentioned that, although you also mentioned that when you moved to New York, you bought seven inches from Dusty Springfield, who at that time, you know, we're also probably like decades and or two, like ago. Right? It's interesting yeah. to see. Um, yeah. Could it also be the case that you undervalued your own music? I certainly, I certainly didn't said I, I didn't really think about how other people valued it. I was more kind of like concerned with my own assessment of of it. And you know, everyone who's in a band, they want it to be the greatest band ever. That's very difficult to achieve, um, and it's very stressful. <laughs> the more you think about that, like that's not how you achieve like you know, kind of like, that's not how you get to what, where you want to be is just mm -hmm. by wanting it really hard. It's by, yeah. it's by doing the, doing the work and, and, and doing other things. But, um, yeah, I guess that's, maybe I'll, 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 I'll leave it there. Correct me if I'm wrong. As I said, Dessau is going to be released on vinyl for the first time ever, right? I mean, this is, so, um, in the U S this came out in, um, last fall and really that was for me the the thing that um you know that that definitely there there was that took some uh you know there was some demons or there were some problems associated with that record there's reasons why that record didn't come out in 1992 when we recorded it um and so when when numero said hey we would really like to put this out i was very reluctant initially um but um, now I'm like super, I'm super pleased that it, that it came out. And one of the reasons I'm super pleased that it came out was at the time we really wanted to have, I'd seen this painting called The White Birch, which I just thought was just incredible. And I, I wanted it for the cover. I wanted it as part of like the, the, the record 
Um, and so, you know, I was in the process of like contacting the people that, that owned the painting. And, you know, this was 1990, in the 90s. So there weren't high resolution copies of it on, online. There was, the only way to get, get it was to, to write them and to ask them for permission and ask them for a negative. And um, meanwhile, we were doing the record and it, it just wasn't as, as great as I wanted it to be. Um, and um, we had this great studio we were recording in, but I heard these like, on just on my vocal tracks, these like noises that just were really bothering me, these kind of like high pitched, like microwave, I don't know, like it doesn't sound very good, I'll admit it, um, uh, that no one else could hear, but um, but they really, like they really, like I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I kind of couldn't continue with it. And so, um, you know, we ended up like scrapping those sessions and going on recorded the Barely Real EP. And and then a bunch of those songs after Chris left, we ended up recording ultimately with with Doug Sharon. Um, but I actually really, in now listening to it, I actually really like the Dessau recordings. They don't seem so, so terrible to me. Um, I think some of the tempos are actually like, make the songs more enjoyable, um, are certainly less challenging. Um, I think, you know, Mike McMacken did a great job. It sounds, I think it sounds really good. Um, so we're all still alive. It seemed that like a band puts out a record, you should, we should do some shows to, to promote and then let people who like the record hear, hear it live. So that's, that's, that's brought us to, to where we are. I'm actually like, Unlike 2012, when I was terrified of, of doing shows and full of doubt, I am really, I'm, I'm excited about doing shows this time. We're, we're still only going to do maybe, I think, 10 shows in um, the EU and, and uh, a show in London, um, and about maybe a little more than 10 shows in the U.S., and that's going to that's gonna be it probably for the next 10, 10 years. For the next decade. <laughs> Yes, yeah. I was like once a decade, like a, you know, a distant, uh, a distant comet will will come through. So, um, so that's the that's the plan. But so um, the, the, yeah, the opposite I'm, of I'm, the Rolling glad. Stones. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that that, that Numero like they were <laughs> a champion for us, and um, I'm glad that they encouraged us to to put this record out mm -hmm. um, because it is actually like we did. Those are nice recordings with Chris. I really like the songs a lot. There's, there's, um, some of those. There was a couple of the songs that came out on the Numero reissues in 2012, mm -hmm. but um, it's nice to hear them together as a as a record. I, I think mm -hmm. it came out really well. Definitely. And we got the and we got the painting that and I wanted the back then. We got the painting for the for the cover. That that almost. Was like worth it for me I'm, I'm very happy and nowadays it's easier to get a cover or to get something like that right 30 yeah. years ago that was difficult i can imagine um yeah. how how do you remember the, the your times you know your times as a band let's say from uh the the mid 80s when you started to let's say the, the release of white birch how do you remember those those years it was nearly a decade yeah um when I when I met John Engel in 1987, I was like, oh, it was it was love at first sight for me. So I was like, I'm going to be in a band with this guy. It's going to be great. And um, it actually took several it took several years to to for that to actually happen. And I think initially he really was not he was not on board with with my description of what Codeine the band was was going to be. He said it's like, well, that's a really interesting. Like I described it to him, he's like, "Well, that's really interesting. But like, who, who's gonna, who would want to play guitar for that? Who's gonna mm. play guitar for that?" It's like, "You are, you big dummy." <laughs> um, and I think he ended up, he ended up being the perfect, the perfect guitarist for for Cody. And it's really hard for me to imagine um, anyone else. And um, and I think you know, Chris Chris Brokaw and then and then Doug Sharon, they were perfect for the band. Um, perfect for the band as well. So, you know, it it was um, I think a very challenge. You know, it was a challenging time, but also really it was like from for the kind of music and the 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 kind of cohort of musicians that we were in, um, at least for you know until Nevermind. 
um, it was a very much, even, even after that, kind of an anti-careerist, um, not make, like not uh, uh, a, making a living, um, surviving maybe as a musician, um, but not making a big, like not making a long and like, uh, you know, rock star career of it. Um, but certainly, you know, music means, music and still means a lot, uh, a lot to me. So um, it was, it was amazing. And, um, you know, but also very, like for me, very stressful. I, I had a lot of the responsibility as a, um, as a band leader, whereas now both John and, and, and Chris um, shoulder, um, shoulder a lot more of the, a lot more of the, the, um, the responsibilities. And that's, that's also very, very helpful for me. Um, so I can just concentrate on being like the best band member, musician, singer, participant, and I'm less, less stressed out about, um, about yeah. things. Probably also because this is not what brings food to the table, right? Right. It is not like, this is not how I pay my rent now to be, you know, this is how Chris broke, you know, Chris Brokaw has not had a nine to five job since maybe ever. Like he had, he worked a little bit, um, had some, some kind of part-time work, um, after college, but he's been a musician steady since, since then John Engel, um, has been kind of marginally employed in the way that it seems like only New Yorkers can, can do, um, uh, since, you know, before and, and since. So, um, he's a, he lives a charmed life. Which is also a way to find your own Nirvana, right? It is. Um, and, and you just you just mentioned the band, and I I don't know if I if I misinterpreted, but I think I heard like a little, let's say, sad undertone somewhere in there when you spoke about like okay everything up to Nirvana. How did you perceive that moment when grunge broke? <laughs> I mean, like uh, you you were on, you were on the grunge label, right? We were on the grunge label, and. Um, while I actually never saw them back in back in the day, I'm originally from the Northwest um, and had gone out, gone to college there for for a little bit, particularly in the in the you know mid '80s, and I was deep deep into Northwest bands, um, Green River, U-Men, um, Soundgarden. Skin yard. Those were, um, you know, I like, I loved seeing those bands. And so for me to, for us to be on, get onto Sub Pop was just like a dream come true for me. I was just like, we are on the coolest label. Um, and yeah, it was really kind of, it was just startling that when Nirvana, when punk broke, as you said, when punk broke, that was just like, wow, that's just incredible. But, but it also like, you know, we saw, you know, we, every band sees themselves as being unique. Every person sees themselves as like unique and unique cir circumstances and so on. And so I just didn't, it didn't seem like something that necessarily applied to us, but I saw all these bands, Royal Trucks got signed to Geffen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I really yeah. like Royal Trucks, but that was an insane, an insane moment. Um, hey, come on, Alison Chains was signed to it, Columbia. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, there's like, it, it so that, that was kind of a, a, that was an amazing shift um, uh, in things. And, um, you know, I think, but for us being on Sub Pop was great. I mean, we, we, we were kind of anti-grunge um, and I certainly felt anti-grunge in so far as like, I was like a, not a histrionic, like over the top, like singer, because I didn't, like our, my, my life, our lives are rarely, um, are rarely like, like, uh, Eddie Vedder, like I'm still alive. Like, it's yeah. just, that's yeah. just not yeah. how, how yeah. I experienced life or even how I felt like I wanted the, the music for, for us to do. And so, um, it was super beneficial for us to be on sub pop because we would play and it was like, oh yeah, from the from the island of Sub Pop, here comes Codeine. But then people would be like, oh, more quickly, please. Just, <laughs> they, they wanted 
they wanted the the you know the grunge thing and, and that was not you know that that wasn't what we um what we gave them um yeah like can you just put it up three volumes and play it five times harder and faster yeah yeah that definitely was and is not coding that's true was it more quickly please yeah 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 well i only got 15 minutes um shout it out to us but you know interestingly nowadays whenever people or whenever i talk to people about coding they're like co what okay let's give you a lesson mm -hmm. you know low yes you know you tango yes you like those yes then listen to this um and that is something that struck me you know a lot of the things that you developed are what later was to was called like slow core right um and and you know did any of you guys really have a core background like punk or hardcore or you know uh i think you know chris chris is probably the the one with the the most um the most punk and, and hardcore roots um he's he's pleased to tell you that uh one of the bad brains like videos of, of uh, Irving Plaza, he's one of the kids that's flipping off the stage. So like, he, you know, I think that's, Chris has always been like the, the rocker of, of, the, um, of, of the band. Um, you know, when I met John Engel, he was playing Beatles and Kink songs on guitar in his room. And um, after Codeine, he pretty much went back to, to, to doing that. Um, and I didn't, yeah, I came from, I felt maybe like a very much of an outsider, but I was too like shy or introverted to be part of a, of a, of a scene and, and too kind of isolated and suburban to be really exposed to much um, punk stuff. I mean, I, you know, there's things that, that lots of people like resonates with lots of people like void. I mean, and, and that's, that, that, was amazing, but also like I've been exposed to and really liked the MX80 sound records when I was um, in high school and college, and 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 the Chrome, the Chrome records too, courtesy of, of Ralph Records. But yeah, there, you know, I think the core thing was interesting to certainly interesting to me, um, but never I was never part of a of the scene, and 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 John wasn't either, um, and you know then we went. We went to college. Like you know, you're you're not a punk in college. You're you're a college student, and yeah. um, so Chris Chris is the, the, probably the closest of any any one of us who might have been in a in a in a in a music scene. But can you understand why people call you like pioneers of that slow core sound? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think um, you know, there's there's kind of. I mean, there's some kind of stereotypical aspects to uh, the, you know what what kind of became thought of as like a slowcore um, uh, genre, um, but but yeah, we we definitely um, were involved in in some of those. I mean, like slow tempos, not um, not shouty or like you know like overly impassioned vocals. Um, but I'm I'm hoping that the way that we Played those, played those songs, and, and wrote those songs. That um, that there's something past those kind of um, affectations or kind of mm -hmm. stylistic, um, uh, you know, tropes, and um, and hopefully about the people can feel the, the the songs. And I I think you know we we never were like kind of a groove or kind of feeling band. Like I think like Unwound. So Unwound, who I really like a lot, have done you know they they. Um, They've done a bunch of shows in the last in the last year. Um, Numero Group Ken Ken Shipley of Numero Group has a, been a huge Unwound fan from 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 the beginning, um, and that is a band that like really has kind of like grooves or feelings. Their songs are kind of grooves and feelings, and um, I I you know I've hoped that that uh, Codeine music is more um, songs and less particular kind of like groove or, or or atmosphere um you know it's it's, it's slow core is a funny it's fun it's a funny yeah. term i don't i don't mind um 
you know, it wasn't bad for us. So people need like labels that have, that's helpful to kind of like, I don't know, helpful shorthand. And um, and I think you know bands bands like Low, um, even kind of like I don't know neo slowcore bands like we're doing. Pardon me, we're doing some shows with this UK band Death Crush, and I, you might say they're kind of neo slowcore. I mm -hmm. you know, but but um, but I think they're I think they're good too. So um, yeah, I don't I don't mind the slowcore. Thing. And, I, you know, I like to think that we're like not just slowcore, but I definitely understand why people like, you know, use that term. And, and um, I actually tried to make a, a um, uh, like a T-shirt with like a turtle on it. So the codeine NYC slowcore, <laughs> but the rest, the, the rest of the band vetoed it. So I, you know, so maybe we'll have a, I think, you know, I was able to get a, 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 a turtle T-shirt, you know, coding with like a turtle, but but uh, not we, they, the NYC slowcore was just too horrifying to <laughs> Chris and, and others. So I don't think that's going to happen. Do you also feel some kind of honor in hindsight when when you know bands like Cave In uh, name themselves after one of your songs? Uh, when when bands like Low or also Mogwai. Uh, name you as influences is there some kind of honoring element in that for you oh yeah i mean i'm like deeply deeply flat like mogwai's championing of us and mogwai had asked us several times to do shows all tomorrow's parties um before we ended up doing that in, in 2012 and um and their support and like name checking us was actually like i think really really helpful and and um yeah i think name checking bands is something that um is like a yeah it's a nice thing to um to acknowledge kind of lineage or or influence um i think low is just a you know a, a fantastic a fantastic band that's you know they, they've gone they have consistently gone i mean while they may I guess slow core might be applied to that band i think they've gone um consistently so far Yeah, so yeah. far past that, um, yeah. a really a remarkable band, and and um, you know that's very very tragic the 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 early death of, of Mimi Parker, um, but yeah, it is flattering. I mean, I and and um, we actually at the end of the uh, when the first the first New York show of our um, 2012 tour, we actually we got Stephen Brodsky to um, to play with us, um, came on stage and. Played um, the song Caven with him. Oh, interesting! Um, Good choice was, for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was uh, that was yeah. super fun. You know, he's a um, you know Caven is an amazing. You know, John thinks they sound like Led Zeppelin, um, uh, or maybe they had did a Led Zeppelin cover that that um, they did. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, no, it is gratifying. It's gratifying that people like still care about the about the band and when they have an opportunity to. To hear the band like like when um our cover of atmosphere was on this the american tv show 13 reasons why a lot of people like were first you know that's the, that's the first time they heard the band and and um you know and then i think some of them at least really really um were able to get into our other songs probably you know like shows like that can definitely push bands a lot um, it was not something that like bands in my cohort would ever have, you know, didn't do commercials, weren't in yeah, you know, yeah. movies. I remember when Mazzy Star was in a Batman movie, people were like, wow, what is happening to the world? Yeah, that's true. Um, let's just step one little moment back and let's also talk about the way that the songs were written. You know, how did you guys write songs back in the 90s? You know, did did you write them all together or separately? Was there a main songwriter, you or one of the other three? Was it a democratic process? How must we envision that? Um, the the way I had learned, <clears throat> the way I had learned songwriting um, was using uh, four track cassette recorders. And um, I, I, you know, played around with them for a while. And 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 uh, while I was in college, I wrote you know, 
but but really like the the coding songs were um, I wrote the coding songs on four track in my in you know in my in my room um, with a often with a drum machine that that Sue Young Park of um, of Bitch Magnet and later Seam had had given me. Uh, Sue so, so Young was a huge influence on um, on 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 me actually even writing songs and and um, uh, I think there's some there's some coding songs definitely had it. You know, not borrowed. It certainly were at least influenced by, by, by Bitch Magna. I think the guy's an amazing, you know, amazing songwriter. We even covered a song that he and he and Lexi Mitchell had, had written on our on our first record. Um, so yeah, so the songs I wrote the songs, um, and I wrote the songs guitar and and you know bass and vocals, and then I would brought them into the band, and mostly I gave them to John. And then I'm a I'm not a good guitar player, so. It really was up to, and I could not remember what I played. Um, I would only can only learn like what I needed to do for the song, and then it just like out of my head. And so I would give the tapes to John, and then John would have to figure out like what it was that I, what it was that I played. And then yeah, we worked out arrangements, um, you know, with with Chris. But um, I think I often have thought of John as like the the musical director. Um, of of the of the band, I wrote the songs and and, and certainly sung them. But um, John and 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 Chris also were 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 part of the arrangements. But John played a big role. Mm. And you know, you've already mentioned a few, but are there any particular influences that that you know brought you to where you were as a as a bass player, as um, as a guitar player, as a songwriter. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mentioned Sue Young Park. Um, going back a moment, not so much like an influence on on songwriting or 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 anything, but but when you talk about like, well, what things were kind of like flattering, like for 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 me, um, I would say like as a contemporary band, Slint. Um, their record Spiderland is just a, a masterpiece, and so for for me, when we're mentioned with Slint, I find that very gratifying. I loved Spiderland as a record. Those guys are just completely insane. Britt and Brian are just like nuts. Completely, those kids are just they. Well, back then they were you know back then they were kids compared to compared to us. Um, and I think another person that was actually like well not necessarily influence on my songwriting, but someone very helpful and encouraging to me was um, was David Grubbs. And um, he's a prince of a fellow, very talented, like, I don't know, music, music thinker. Um, and yeah, I think that he, he was very encouraging to, um, very encouraging to us, very encouraging to me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, yeah, that people can have a big influence on uh, on you, even when they don't necessarily think that they that they are. But yeah, his encouragement and some um, and Sue Young's encouragement, I think, also were were really helpful. What I always imagined back in the day, and I still do, is that all three of you have like a very literary vibe around it. There were some kind of textures where I felt like, okay, there. There must be some kind of, for me, yet undiscovered literary background in um, in coding. Is that just my imagination, or is it really the way that you know the three of you were lovers of literature? I think one one shared point of of art um, was for 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 both. John and I saw together Antonioni's Red Desert, and um, I think that is like for me aesthetically that that was a that's a huge, I mean I, that that just I, I just thought was in, just incredible, and um, uh, even like the first five minutes where basically it's just like you hear the roar of the factory, and and there is. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 um, Monica Vitti is like you know like luminous, 
um, as a person that's kind of alienated by capital and you know there's all these kind of like monochromatic like Rothko like things I, you know so I think that <laughs> it's funny that is that that definitely to me was like if not an influence at least really resonated with me as an aesthetic that 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 I I, I wanted um, I think another thing you know I, I in college I had read um, Thomas Thomas Mann's the the Magic Mountain and I think that coupled with Alan Renee's last year in Marion Bod, definitely the inspiration for the the this uh, the use of the Castle Belvedere postcard for the cover of Barely Real. Um, so you know, not super, not necessarily super literary, but definitely there were there were aesthetics that that influenced the 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 band, um, and not just not just music musical ones, but but also other other ones. You've already mentioned, you know, the cover of a barely real EP, which is a, a postcard of a castle, of a European castle. Um, is there a certain fascination for the old world in you? I mean, like Dessau, come on, that's, that's like obviously a city in Eastern Germany. Right. It's it's interesting. So the 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 title of um, the title of Dessau. Um, while I think it's yes, it is it is an Eastern German um, or formerly Eastern German city. Um, the the title of that record is is actually taken from the recording studio um, that uh, where we where we you know recorded re recorded it, which a Harold Dessau recording was this studio now now closed um, in the I guess financial district area of um, of Manhattan. Um, the old world, I, I mean, the, yeah, there are, yeah, as I said, I think the, the, the Castle Belvedere last year at Marion Bod, I, I think that's the, you know, kind of like intentionally, challengingly minimal. And I, I think that's definitely the minimalism of, of, of those, those two movies, the minimalism of this kind of like very formal but but in many ways kind of like empty i mean like formal that just dominates these like tiny little people they're just like kind of incidental to the larger the larger formal picture mm -hmm. uh, I, I so um you you mentioned that you were not part of a scene which i can understand you know when when listening to codeine it is some kind of introvert music true um but you know one can be listening to a lot of stuff from a certain place without being part of a scene you know like uh, growing up in the early 90s of course we listened to a lot of seattle stuff although we never were there um so mm -hmm. you've you've mentioned that you know um uh you, you moved to new york um and 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 also Matt John there. How did you perceive the New York scene from the outside back then? Yeah, I mean, I think once once we started playing shows, I mean, I think John and I maybe met the first time at a big black show. Um, okay. So and like you know, so that was there was a scene. I'm not saying like it's it's more when I think about like what my influences were like you know prior to like Codeine. I wasn't really part of the scene, and then I was like, you know, like a college student just studying hard and and trying to figure out, like, I don't know, trying to figure out life. And and um, uh, but but um, you know, once we started playing shows, then I definitely felt we were part of a part of a scene in New York. There were multiple scenes. There was there was the the New York hardcore scene, like pro mags and and that sort of stuff. We weren't we weren't part of that. Um, there was the kind of like the New York scene of um, Unsane and Surgery. You know, we weren't really part of that. We were more like the kind of, I don't know, like we played with, we played with kind of softer bands like Sleepyhead, for instance, or, or mm -hmm. um, brief, brief band Love Child. Um, those were kind of like, um, you know, played with Seam and, and Superchunk and 
Um, I think maybe only once or twice Yolo Tango. Um, so yeah, but we were part of, you know, there was like a New York scene, there was like, you know, Homestead Records and, and other people putting out their, their own records, merge records. So, you know, we were part of that, we were part of that um, indie rock scene, you know, the indie mm -hmm. rock scene and, and um, like, I loved Sepado. You know that that there was a scene for sure, and mm -hmm. um, Sabado was a, a great, challenging with Barlow's like, a, you know, amazing. Um, that band, <laughs> yeah, Jason, Eric, Lou, what a band. And last question before before we come to our infamous quickfire round here at Vale of Sound. Um, one of your singles, uh, one of the singles that were released by Numero in 2012 has a layout that looks very, very similar to a certain label that you were on before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Who came up uh, with the idea? T to put it clear for everybody, one of, one of the, one of the uh, pre, pre, I think it's the only pre-release single before the, um, the re-releases in 2012. <laughs> one of them looks like uh, the old sub pop singles club design, right? Uh, yeah, uh, with, with uh, not quite um, uh, Charles Peterson uh, uh, the photo of you know action live action. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So this this really was um, this this was entirely from the the mind of the the people in Numero, um, who you know like they were they were kids back then, um, and sub pop was like you know. Then they started a label too. It's something, you know, it's like if you're a kid and you're starting a label or you were a kid back then, you're starting a label. And that's the sort of thing that they geek out on. And um, yeah, and then they even made like a little N-U-M-E-R-O yeah, like yeah, yeah. logo that looks like Sub Pop. And they're like, you know, they're very excited about that for, you know, for them. So like, you know, that's, that, that record is always a challenge. Well, I don't know if it's always a challenge, but, but you know, it took me a while to get to the place where it's like, it's our music, it's their reissue. Like, there has to be room for them to be involved, engaged, feel their, you know, their commitment and their expression. And so um, maybe like initially, I might have had resistance to some parts of their, you know, their decisions or things that they wanted to do. But ultimately, a band, unless you're like Prince alone in the studio, a band is a is a collaboration and certainly a, a, a record release of the collaboration um, and often, you know, strengthened uh, because of that. So, um, yeah, but that's there, like, you know, they get to geek out on the, on the sub pop thing. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's fine by me. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't bother me. And, and, you know, to be, to be fair, it's not that we were utterly uninfluenced by this. So for instance, I think the cover of the our realized single and ultimately the image that was used for the the big the box set in 2012 um, was a kind of like a you know blurry live you know like you know thing that this kind of like you know things in action um, you know that that we we put picked that because. That was, you know, we were going to do a single of the month club. We did a single of the month club for Sub Pop. And so we wanted to give them kind of like a, yeah. you know, Sub Poppy type of cover. And that's what ended up being the, the cover. And I'm asked actually, like, I think it's a, it's a, it was a good image, even if it's not like the three of us playing is like, you know, bass, drums, guitar. But um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, but that's anyway, that was Sub Pop geeking, or uh, Numero geeking out on Sub Pop and, um, I want to give a shout out to Sub Pop too because because we had our our contract and our their rights um, they owned the the recordings for North America and and Japan in perpetuity they kept our records in print and um, that meant that our our music has been available um, at least in the U S um, you know uh, the whole time but really up until last fall it wasn't available in EU or UK digitally and um yeah so i'm i'm you know sub pop did great for us um and numero is like really doing doing great for us too i'm very appreciative so the infamous quickfire round you always get two alternatives uh -huh. like 
wine versus beer or red versus blue or whatever and you have to choose which one you like more or which one you would prefer at this very moment uh, let's start off with something simple uh which early punk band however if it's if it's punk or not would you rather listen to chrome or suicide Oh shit! That's so hard. <laughs> that is like that. Uh, um, oh, wow. That that's not that doesn't start off easy. That starts off incredibly hard. Those are two bands I really, I deeply, deeply like appreciate and listen. To. So shall we put uh, it back a little bit so you can think about it? Yeah. Okay. No, Coney. I'm gonna, I, I got to figure it out. Co I'm Coney to, Island I'm versus the Hamptons. Okay. Coney Island versus the Hamptons. Which one would you oh, rather? Coney Island. Like, the Mets that's, versus that's the easy. Yankees. The Mets. Uh, okay. Sonic Youth versus Sabado. Oh, 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 that's so tough. Uh, I mean, like, what I would rather listen to or what I think is important. I would rather listen what to What you would Sebado. rather listen to? Sabado? Okay. Yeah, I would rather listen to Sabado. I think, you know, like, Big picture, probably Sonic Youth is more, more important than meaningful. But I, 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 yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I've listened to both a lot because you know that was my that was the scene that I was in. Yeah, you've mentioned your love for Dusty Springfield, and everybody knows the perfect usage of Dusty Springfield in Quentin Tarantino's movie. So I'll give you two Tarantino movies: Pulp Fiction or Jackie Brown. I'm not a huge Tarantino fan, but I, I guess I, I would say Jackie Brown. Like to okay. see female protagonists and and um yeah. So I go with Ooh. that. What is your preferred way of listening to music at the moment? Vinyl or streaming? Well, like I guess it's not so much a question of preferred. Everyone would like to say they prefer listening to stuff on vinyl. But in reality, most people listen to stuff on whether it's streaming or like, you know, on their on their phone playing into headphones or whatever, um, zeros and ones. So like that it's and I don't I don't like, you know, carry around a, a Sony Walkman with little like foam headphones. Um, so I can't say cassette. That would be really a poser move. Um, so I'm sure the most most of the music that I listen to is digital. Um, you know, and a fair amount of it is digital because it's on YouTube, and that's that's how like how you access like um, uh, all sorts of music. We have um, Kratzen from Cologne is opening up for us in Hamburg, and I, but I don't. There's no vinyl Kratzen. There's no Kratzen vinyl for yeah. me to access, but um, but the. I can get a link and listen to, and I was like, yeah, this is cool. Like, like they got a moat, they kind of got the motor beat. Like, it's just, yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I can't say vinyl. I, I would love, would prefer to listen to stuff on vinyl, but really, like, it's, 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 yeah. I, I, zeros and ones, they, they won the, they won the day. There's no, there's no really kind of going back, but it is pleasurable to listen to vinyl, see beautiful vinyl, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Unsane versus the Jesus Lizard. I liked both those bands. <laughs> this is yes. like these are these. I I'd see that this is the. I, I'm afraid I'm like I'm not fast enough on the lightning part of this. Oh, that's um, okay. You can take your time. Oh, um, that actually would be easy for me. I mean, I. I think I'm gonna stay unsane. Those guys are just like relentless. Um, and like the David Yao's and he's. Yeah, I haven't seen David Yao fronting Flipper. The 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 rhythm section for for Jesus Lizard is just unstoppable. That that guy's a great guitar player. But um, yeah, I think unsane. There is something about unsane that just also matches my mood much more often than Jesus Lizard. <laughs> Okay, something easy. McCartney versus Lennon. Yeah, Mike McCartney. Okay. 
Um, Green River versus Mother Love Bone. Green River. Um, Low versus Yola Tango. I know, but that is a hard one. That would also be a hard one for me. Yola Tango is so much easier to listen to. That's true. Low is a, it really requires like a different kind of attention and, and mood. And I can, I can zone, like you can kind of come in and out of focus of Yola Tango mm -hmm. where low requires a different, a different level of listening. And so um, listening to Yola Tango would give me more flexibility. Right. Um, but, um, and also I love George's voice love George's voice and she didn't you know initially she didn't really sing that was That's something true. that really was added added to them later and um yeah so I'm gonna have to say Yola Tango although yeah I, I that was amazing and then we still have to back to Chrome versus Suicide I did not forget yeah um <clears throat> <laughs> well this is super tough the 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 um uh girl off off the off the first suicide record is just so you know there's nothing there was nothing quite as um i don't know i i guess it's hard to say like which i would rather listen to probably i've listened to suicide more recently than i have mm -hmm. chrome so i guess i would say suicide because um yeah, I would, I would, I would say suicide. Um, and now, yeah. So, thanks for all the answers, Stephen. Um, thanks for your time. Everybody, remember when this interview is released uh, in a few days, you can get the reissues of one of the, I would say, seminal New York bands. Uh, and I love a lot of New York music, but Codeine always was very special to me. Um, everybody, if you uh, liked this, then give us a little shout out on Facebook, on wherever you want to. If you want to support us a little more, have a look at our Patreon. And Stephen, your chance for final last words now. I just give my thanks to um, Thorsten, to you and to, to Vale of Sound. And um, I'm sorry that we're not playing more shows in, in Germany, but um, I am really looking forward to playing, to playing Hamburg um, in, um, I guess, at the very end of August yes. with Kratzen. And then uh, we're playing a, um, a festival in, in Berlin, um, in Berlin after that. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this challenging, some very challenging questions at the end there. <laughs> I'll be thinking about these questions for a little bit. So I, I thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for your time, my friend. Okay. Enjoy the rest okay. of your day.